you stack the decks in your favor by mm -hmm. creating systems that make it easier and easier to do yeah. the things that are essential so that we can do them consistently and end up where we want to end up with having lived an essential life. I want to jump right in. Um, I love your work. Um, I've, I've recently discovered about six months ago and had to have you on the show. And one of the questions that have been firing up in my belly, my belly, if you will, is why is it so important or why are people trading a meaningful life? What, what are they trading for a meaningful life versus like a purposeless, purposeless present? Like it's almost like we're making a, a, a backwards trade of sorts. Yeah, sometimes I ask people in audiences when I'm doing sort of a, a keynote for an event, I'll say, okay, what did we gain as we went into mobile technologies, right? What did we gain since we've had the phone? And people will list, well, we have uh, flexibility. Uh, you know, you can communicate from anywhere, uh, mm -hmm. any when. And they'll sort of list them and there are some advantages. And then on the other side, I'll say, okay, what did we give up? What did we trade off? Yeah. And literally the answers are uh, freedom, <laughs> uh, my life. Awesome. Uh, you know, freedom, life, uh, some some flexibility. It's like yeah. these. This was not a great trade off. Now, your question isn't just about mobile technology and phones and so on and that trade off, but but the deeper question of why do people give up a life, an essential life, mm -hmm. for a trivial life? Why would yeah. we do that? Uh, and and of course, there's there's lots of reasons that we do this, but uh, but among them is well, among them, and this is a more recent answer to the question to this conundrum, but, but a recent answer is that I think a lot of otherwise um, overachievers mm -hmm. really believe that the essential path is harder. Yeah. And so, so they, 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 can, they sometimes give up uh, before they barely begun. Mm -hmm. It's the equivalent of, you know, when somebody's looking at a slide and it has 500 words on it. Mm -hmm. We don't read the first 400 and give up. We just do the pre-scan. We're like, uh, no, I'm never going to read that. <laughs> yeah, I'm guilty. And, and so that's what I think people do sometimes with the essential things, the meaningful things, to build a great relationship, the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the have, a, have, have a great family, have good health and exercise, and, and these sort of essential things in life. I think that sometimes they just seem so overwhelming that mm -hmm. we just quickly, before we've barely begun, we do the pre-scan, oh, I'm just going to get... You know, I'll just do this easy but trivial stuff over there. Yeah. And after years of watching this and working with people on it, I realized that that you've got to discover how both of these are like a false idea. It's a false dichotomy. Mm -hmm. You've got to discover that there really is a way to create life where you you stack the decks in your favor by mm -hmm. creating systems that make it easier and easier to do yeah. the things that are essential so that we can do them consistently and end up where we want to end up with having lived an essential life. Yeah, I think that's powerful because, you know, one of the things that I've been, I guess, on my own journey and trying to figure out life and business and all the things that go into it, obviously doing, you know, video and speaking and shows and all this kind of stuff is how to determine what the highest priority would be. And I finally got down to the place where I was using a terminology of, okay, how does it multiply? How does what I'm doing today multiply my time in the future? How does what I'm right. spending on today multiply my money in the future? Talk a little bit about the priorities because I think that's where a lot of us get it wrong. We think we're doing the most important thing mm. or, and, then, and then we don't realize it comes at a cost. So yes. how, do we, how do we break that crazy cycle? Well, there's, there's two parts riffing on what you're saying, right? The first is about, priority, is, is, is about the word priority. And then the second is about residual results. I, let's connect those. But first, the word priority came into the English language in the 1400s. And it was singular. Uh, what did it mean? It meant not just one thing, it meant the very first thing, the priorist thing. And that's a very useful word, you know, to, to, to enter uh, our vocabulary. It stayed singular, according to Peter Drucker, for the next 500 years. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't until the Industrial Revolution that somebody started introducing the idea of priorities. <laughs> and in a sense, that word is, is a strange word because you say, well, can you have very, very many, very first before all other things things? Yeah. And the answer is, uh, yeah, of course, no, you can't. Uh, and yet that's what 
you know, people, maybe, maybe each of us have been to meetings where uh, someone says, here are my 34 priorities. Yeah. Uh, they all have to be done before everything else. So just right from the get go, getting back to the original definition to really saying, okay, there's lots of important things. There's lots of good things. There's lots of interesting things. There's lots of trivial things, but there can only be by definition in any given moment, one priority. Mm -hmm. and trying to get ourselves back to that. What's important now? That has a nice acronym, WIN. What's yeah. the most important? What's important now and coming back to that and being in that moment and, and giving our attention to that? That's the priority side of the equation. But you said something else that I just don't want to miss, which is that increasingly in your business, if I understood you right, in your life, you're saying, well, I don't want to just do stuff or good stuff yep. or valuable things even. I want to identify the, the, that vital few things that will produce results for me many, many times over. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and that, that second subject is one that's been really interesting to me ever since I wrote Essentialism. Mm -hmm. And so interesting to me, really, so, so important to me that I ended up writing a new book on it called Effortless. Yeah. Um, and if, you, if, if, if you'll allow me just to share one story to illustrate Please. the Absolutely. importance. Absolutely. The, the, I have a friend, Jessica Jakely, who, uh, Jessica Jakely, who went when she was uh, younger to Africa to try and make a difference there. Mm -hmm. uh, she wants to make an impact. She's trying, that's what her goal is, impact. And she finds an entrepreneur there who is at the subsistence level. Uh, she is selling produce on the side of the road every day. If she's not there today, then she doesn't make enough money to be able to eat herself or feed her children. Mm -hmm. So it's like pure subsistence level. It's like literally she just gets one result for one amount of effort. And if she stops the effort, she stops the result and yep. she's in trouble. Yep. So Jessica says, well, I'd like to help with that. I'd like to help basically provide her with the income necessary to build a better system. What she found was that a, a relatively modest investment of $500 would help her, this, uh, the, 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 this entrepreneur, to be able to go and a, a create a flow, um, a process flow where the food would be delivered directly to her instead of to a middleman mm -hmm. who takes the profit out of it. So it's a pretty small thing. You can say even there, that's leverage, right? Yeah. $500 given or invested allows her to shift and change her business because she's no longer working you know, in her business, she's working on her business. Yep. That's a success story in and of itself, but yep. it gets better because Jessica Jackley had just gone to a, uh, to, to Muhammad Yunus presentation on micro loans. And she says, okay, well maybe we should do it. It's a micro loan. We give yeah. $500, but it comes back. Now we've got a 10 X impact because we're going to yeah. help this entrepreneur and many, many other. Okay. That's great. But then she doesn't stop there. She says, well, hold on. If that's what we're trying to do, what if we created a system that created systems? So they started a website, this is kiva.org. And this allows any entrepreneur in the world who, or any investor in the world who says, I want to pay, put in a relatively modest amount and it will be invested and reinvested and so on. So this is the current state of affairs is that $500 on the one side versus what they've done, which is $1.3 billion in loans wow. with a 97% repayment of loans. That's the power of creating residual effortless results. That's yeah. the difference. It's not a 10 X difference or a hundred X difference. In this case, it's significantly beyond even a thousand X impact. Yeah. So to me, even though that's quite a grandiose example, it's the kind of thing that we ought to be looking for if we want to achieve at a 10 X, hundred X, thousand X level that matters because every person listening to this or watching this right now wants better results, right? That's who, that's who shows yeah. up here. I get Absolutely. That significantly better results if they can get them. So let's say 10 X, even 10 X results. Can any person listening or watching this work 10 X harder? I would say no. And that's the problem. That's yeah. the, that's the <clears throat> dilemma. That's why I wrote this new book on effortless because, because nobody can work 10, no, the, the people I'm writing to can't work 10 X harder, but they still want 10 X results. And that means you have to find a smarter, easier, more effortless strategy to be able yeah. to produce it. And residual results, of course, is, is one of the, uh, the key ways to be able to achieve that.
Yeah, and I would argue that that young lady also, you know, she set up a, set up with a goal for impact. I would dare say that she made a larger impact with the micro loans than she did with the stand. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. So, 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 so Jessica's trying to. Uh, I mean, she's trying to I I increase her impact, and she does that uh, mm -hmm. by using, uh, you know, by creating a system. Yeah. She didn't do it by just. Uh, by giving out more money herself, she get, did it by building a system that would enable lots and lots of people to be able to produce those results. So it's a, it's to me, it's a very inspiring example. Absolutely. I mean, I, I would second that all, all day long. You know, when you look at Essentialism, your first book that did incredibly well, uh, one that I'm very fond of myself, mm. it seems like one of the bridges between there and effortless, because I, I think your work just continues to build on itself, right? Which is really powerful yes. to watch, right? Um, it makes it really easy for someone like myself to consume your content and get mm -hmm. some, get a benefit from it day after day after day, week after week after week. Thank you. One of the commonalities that I that I get out of both of the books is this power of choice. Mm -hmm. How important is the kind of choice or the power of choice in making a residual, re, you know, uh, a residual impact over time? Yeah, well, it's 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 all the difference, right? It's it, you know, the 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 good news is that none of us can even if we wanted to give away our ability to choose and, and nor can it be taken away from us mm -hmm. like choices can be taken away from us but the ability to choose what to do in any given circumstance cannot be taken away mm -hmm. it cannot be given away it is it is a relentlessly powerful uh force yeah. uh, and so the but what it can be is forgotten and so that's one of the reasons that I write about that theme is because it's it's not like it's a new idea, but it's to try to make sure that it's it's in our present, uh, you know, uh, thought process. Mm -hmm. I don't have to do what I'm doing and I don't have to do it the way that I'm doing it. Yeah, uh, I, I'm thinking here of of a, a classic uh, overachiever, uh, non-essentialist, I suppose, who was the, the kind of person who was, where she said, I'd be up at 4 a.m. in the morning, mm -hmm. photoshopping my youth group at church the next day, even though, you know, like no one's asking me to do that. And it isn't yeah. even that urgent, but I just have that idea. She's part of what my brother Justin calls the hit squad, which yeah. is hardworking, intelligent, talented people, mm -hmm. you know, H-I-T, the yeah. hit squad whose problem is rarely going to be that they don't put in effort. Yeah. Uh, or they don't, they don't try to do things. No, they're highly motivated that they, they, they've got, they're curious and, and have loads of initiative. Like they, they've got all of those assets, yeah. but it also makes them vulnerable. Mm -hmm. As in with her case, she's taken a strength and gone too far with it. So she's there, you know, she says even, even eating lunch, she feels guilty. Mm. And so this is a certain way, she's got a certain paradigm, a certain way of, of operating. And what I was trying to do when I was working with her was to remind her she has a choice. She can make a different choice. Yeah. In fact, a power, particularly powerful choice is to invert. Invert the way she's approaching the world. Mm -hmm. She has to learn a new way of thinking because what got her here won't get her there. For sure. Yeah. And I said, okay, the, the, for you, I said, for you, it's part of the hit squad. You need to start asking this question. How can I make this easy? Yeah. <laughs> How can I make it effortless? See, she yeah. had in her mind, her mindset was very Puritan. It was like, hard work is good. Easy is vice, right? Like mm. I should distrust the easy. And so she would not even look at solutions that were, that, that would potentially be significantly easier. But I, coaching her on this. So the next day she gets a call from a professor at the university. So she's a manager at the university. And they says, he says, I want you to come and record my class for me because yeah, she, that's it. And she's just ready to jump in instead of clarifying, well, what's really going on or let's mm -hmm. find a simple solution to your problem. She's just ready to go. She's thinking, okay, I'm going to maximize this. We're going to have multiple camera people there. Yeah. We're going to have different edit so we'll put it all together we'll add music and intros and outros and graphics and slides and wow him mm -hmm. she is like all of this is mentally happening and then she remembers oh i've got a choice i don't have to do it that way i can at least explore for a moment is there an effortless solution is there an easier way to do this to get the same result 
yeah. with a lot less input. And so she starts asking a couple of clarifying questions. It turns out this is an entire effort for one student who will miss a few classes because of an athletic commitment. <laughs> and so the solution they come up with is that another student in class will just record on an iPhone whenever he's going to miss and send it to him. Yeah. That's the whole solution. The professor <laughs> hadn't thought about it. He was caught up in too much busyness too yeah. to see the solution. And so he's delighted. It was a 10 minute conversation. He's delighted. She hangs up the phone. She's like, how did that happen? I saved four months of work for an entire team yeah. for the power of pausing, remembering I have a choice and inverting the question that I would normally ask into a different question. I think this is an illustration of how choice can be so powerful in getting the results that matter, but at far better return on our effort. Yeah, and I think that's why I wanted to mention this because, you know, I always have this mental image, if you will. Uh, there's a there's a boulder here, and I can walk over to it, and I can pick up the boulder myself. Now, obviously, it's not too big because if it's too big, I can't pick it up. But I can pick <laughs> it up, right? I'm going to yep. struggle. I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to do my little yep. duck walk over to the side and go drop it. Or yep. I can grab a, a, a piece of leverage device, a, a piece of that's rebar right. or a two-by-four, yep. and then walk over and just pop it loose and send it across the way. I've expended less energy. I've expended less time and I've still gotten the work done. And, and when you're saying effortless, that's what I'm hearing you say. I'm hearing yes. you say, stop, pick up the, stop picking up the boulder with your hands, come up with a device or a process or a system that allows you to do that over and over again without you physically having to pick up that rock. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's, 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 it comes back to, you know, we talk about ROI, right? Return on investment. And this is ROE. This is return on effort. We, I'm in favor of effort. I teach it to my children. I use it myself. It's a, a super important strategy in life. Yeah. The only problem is that there's a, it's a finite resource, just yeah. like time is. There's only so much effort that we can put in. But as overachievers, we sometimes have bought into this as being the only strategy. So yeah. we overutilize it. And I've seen that happen to a lot of people in the pandemic over the last year and a half, where they solve the problems that have come, come at them, but just through more effort. And so yeah. what's really happened is they're getting more and more burned out as they do Zoom, eat, sleep, repeat yes. life cycles, yeah. where there's no natural end to the day. They get to five, six, seven, eight, and then it's 10, 11, and so yeah. on. They don't, and then they don't even know what day it is. You know, they, so they're just emailing all through Saturdays and Sundays and meetings and and, and there's no real boundaries in place. Yeah. So they're overutilizing a strategy to the point of, you know, on the edge of exhaustion, on the mm -hmm. edge of burnout, or completely past it. In, in some ways, I think, that, I think that there's like two kinds of people in the world right now. There are people who are burned out, and then there are people who know they are burned out. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And and so it's like an enlightened thing to suddenly discover, oh my goodness, I, I've been following this strategy past its usefulness. Yeah. Where it's 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 now like giving me diminishing returns in my business, in my relationships. And maybe even worse than that, we might get to the point where it's negative returns, mm -hmm. which means that if we put in more effort, we're gonna get worse results overall than if we just yeah. stopped, rested, relaxed, recuperated. But because the paradigm is so dominant, sometimes as this is happening to people, they are unaware of it happening to them. Mm -hmm. And they see, well, I'm not getting the results I want, and therefore I need to push even harder. Yeah. And so you go on this downward cycle and, and this spiral, and it happens to a lot of people, and I, I've noticed a signi significant uptick in this yeah. over the last year and a half. Sure. So it's a perfect opportunity for us just to even explore Maybe there's a different mindset. Yeah. Maybe there's a new paradigm that will help me in this moment, but also for the many levels of success I'd like to achieve going forward. Yeah, absolutely. I got two thoughts that kind of come into mind off of that. <clears throat> the first of which is, you know, if I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to work out a muscle and I'm going to do it X number of days a week, yeah, I get injured or um, maybe I'm in the gym seven days a week instead of six or five. Okay. Yeah. I noticed and I've done, this is me working. This is me using an act, a, a literal yes. analogy of something yes. I've done. I work out seven days a week and I go in on the eighth day, you know, the, yeah. the beginning of the next week yeah. and I'm exhausted. Right. Like I haven't got that recuperation time. I haven't got that. Um, so when I go to pick up a weight, it weighs twice as much as it normally does. Right. <clears throat> the other thing that popped in my mind is with effortless specifically, if I look at the global economy and I look at some of the biggest businesses on the planet, 
Amazon, Apple, Google, <clears throat> some of the largest facilities, businesses on the planet. If I'm honest with myself, there are other development companies out there. There are other internet providers. There are other um, organizations that create phones and tools and computers. But part of the reason they've gotten so big and so gargantuan is because they always find more and more efficient ways to do things, reducing the amount of effort, ergo making things effortless. And if I'm hearing you correctly, that is not just attainable for the select few, but attainable for everybody as long as they choose to focus on it. Yes. I mean, you've used two examples and I want to speak to both of them, but let's just begin with the, just the, well, let's start with the, the exercise. So there's a, uh, one of the coaches of the elite um, UFC fighters mm -hmm. and uh, he was on Joe Rogan yep. and he was talking about this. People could go and watch it, maybe put it in show notes uh, where he starts to explain how he trains these elite fighters. Now, Think of the image of what you'd expect him to say, the kind of, yeah. I mean, of course, no pain, no gain, but you might even expect something far more extreme than that. Like a Rocky B-roll. Right, because <laughs> that's what we've been shown, that's what we've been taught, and there's plenty of people that do follow that type of training exercise. That's, their, that's the paradigm they're coming out of. They're, now, what he said is, is, I believe that when people work out, they should never ache afterwards mm. interesting and joe goes he says he says now you don't mean like beginners you mean like somebody <laughs> who's already at an elite level he says no i mean if i'm working with an absolute beginner they should never feel it the next day yeah. <laughs> right that I'm is so myself, opposite what happened to my no pain no gain thing we've been sold no pain no gain but it's a bill of goods and this this is this is what it comes down to is that we it's like we've been no pain no gain is like the personal development and personal performance equivalent of the medical bloodletting that yeah. lasted for the longest time, <laughs> where you're literally putting leeches yeah. on people's bodies and you're sucking out the blood, thinking that the, that the disease is in the blood and therefore by doing this, you're healing them. I mean, you are hurting them. That's what you're yeah. really doing and sometimes even killing them. But for a long time, the paradigm dominated over the reality. Now that's, that's of course what, what, what happened then and I think is happening now and certainly this coach does he said look what we want he says if I was dealing with a beginner and they can do like the max they can do is let's say 10 pull-ups that would just be like exhaustive if they did 10 pull-ups he said I don't want them to do seven or eight or nine I don't want them to be at the max because if I do they're going to need to recover yeah. You know, well, they do like you're saying, it's so much heavier, it's so much harder. Maybe they don't even want to do it or they yeah. don't do it. They need a day or two off. He said, if I get them to do, let's say five, then the next day they can do five again and the next day five again. So by the time of like Thursday comes around, they've done 20 reps now. They've been yeah. here consistently. Their body's getting used to the idea that they're being asked to do this. Whereas in the person who did 10 to their max, it's taken two days off. Now he's there again, trying to do it again. Yeah, he's only done 10 and he's just, you know, he goes on. I mean, the whole thing is fascinating. Yeah. He goes on deeply about this idea that there's a very different way to achieve high performance. And it really is the, uh, the this, um, this, I mean, it's to do with sustainability, consistency, yeah. not yeah. one time sort of boom and bust performance where you go big and then you're sort of over before you've begun. It's about how to go less than you feel like going so that you can do it again the next day and there's something left in the tank and you can keep it going consistently yeah. and consistently. Um, it, it, you know, th that's like, that's like the, the example when it comes to exercise. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm maybe spending too much time on this, but the, not but at I, all. I, I'll, go, I'll, go, I'll go one, I'll go one step further. Down I'm still the learning. Man. Challenge. <laughs> keep teaching. So one of my favorite case studies that I came across in writing effortless is a, is a story of, um, a story of the race to the poles, South Pole. Mm -hmm. It never been achieved. No one had ever made it to the South Pole. Mm -hmm. Not not uh, not that the British Empire is great naval prowess. Not the Vikings for a thousand years. You know, like no one had ever ever done it. Yeah. And it had captured the imagination of the world at the time. 
it, it, sort of equivalent of that time space race and you know put a man on the moon kind of everybody who's going to be the first and they had lots of failed attempts and then finally there's two teams that are going at the same time so it's a particularly interesting race right to see will one of these make it and who will make it first one team is from norway the other from britain the team from britain captain scott he had a particular approach and his approach was on the good days we're going as far and as fast as we possibly can push them to exhaustion then on the bad days partially because they're exhausted and partially because of the bad weather they stay hunkered down in their tents emotional state for that group was pretty negative because they were just complaining mm -hmm. uh, about how bad the weather was and they're worn out and emotionally exhausted oh has anyone ever no one has ever had worse weather in an attempt to the south pole well actually the team that went before them did have better it did have worse weather mm -hmm. uh so it, it, he actually had relatively good weather but he didn't feel that well that's team one mm -hmm. team two from norway the 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 captain of that group said 15 miles a day good days 15 miles bad weather days 15 miles wrote in his journal one day terrible weather the worst weather we progressed 15 miles he kept this going until the plot thickens when they are 45 miles from reaching the south pole now what would you do what does the overachiever do 45 <laughs> miles let's go <laughs> let's go yeah. with perfect weather yeah great sledding conditions with one big push they can make it in one day and they don't even know where the competitor team is so the, the, to all they know, the team could be a, ahead of them mm -hmm. and still consistency. They took three days to do that last 45 miles, averaging 50 miles per day. That was their yeah. consistency the whole time. Well, they beat their competitive teams by 32 days using this strategy. Holy smokes. Wow. And importantly, on the way home, this team, the Norwegian team actually makes it home. Like, there's enough in their tank to make it out of the freezing desert yeah. that they're in and all the way back to Norway. Whereas in the British team arrived so exhausted, so burned out that they literally not one of them makes it out alive. They all die oh, on the wow. way home. And mm. so you've got this total tragedy versus this total success. Now get this, this is like one more step in the craziness of this story. The biographer for the Norwegian team used this phrase. And I remember when I read it, it just like was just breathtaking to me. I just can hardly believe it even now to share it with you. He said, the Norwegian team achieved this result without particular effort. <laughs> now, listen, it's never been done before. Mm -hmm. It's the most arduous physical challenge for an explorer known to man. Yeah. And it's achieved without particular effort. It's, it's, it's almost unthinkable that he would write such a thing. Yeah. And, and yet that was his description of their experience. Now, of course, there was effort, but it wasn't defined by the, the kind of heroics that we normally think of as we could think of effort. And so it, it, it to me, it shakes it. Sh it should shake us mm -hmm. who have been taught to do hustle, to burn yeah. ourselves yeah. out. To, to that's the only path to success. That's the media yeah. story. That's what we watch in the movies. That's what we see. That isn't actually how to achieve sustainable, superb peak performance. It really literally yeah. isn't. It is a bill of goods that we've been sold. If you want to perform superbly over a long period of time, you need to find consistency. You need to find an effortless pace. And, and, and this illustrates it as well as any I know. No, I love that story. And, you know, it's funny, I've, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking of some team members I've recently been kind of working with coaching. I even did some uh, Instagram live stuff today with our stories, whatever they call it. Yes. Um, and I was talking to him and whatever. And he's and, and he's he's he, he's young. He's aggressive. He's hungry. Um, he's smart. He's you know, yeah, I, I would say he's da darn near genius level intelligence wise. Hmm. And he would he would come up to me all the time and he would say, all right, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. It's going to be, um, it's on from this day forward. It's on. I'm going to be gr on my grind, right? You know, that oh, on my grind thing. Mm, and, my and, grind. and four days, he's up at 5 a.m. He's working until midnight, up at 5 a.m., working until midnight, up at 5 a.m., working until midnight. Day five, he crashes. Day five turns into day nine. Right. And he came to me and said, I don't understand. How are you able to do what you do on a consistent basis? And I said, that's just it. It's the consistency. Yeah. I get up at the same time every day. 
I go through a same routine that I know is going to feed my mind, body, and spirit on a regular basis. I try to look for ways to multiply my time, my talents, and my resources on a consistent basis. And I'm constantly trying to become more aware, primarily from your first book, um, Essentialism, but even more so now with Effortless, of where I'm utilizing the one commodity I don't get, I don't get to get back, time. Yeah. Right. right. I want to make sure that I can duplicate my efforts on a regular basis. He took that advice and over the course of the next 90 days, he got very consistent. And coincidentally, he's outperformed himself two to one to prior <laughs> performance, which is pretty, which is pretty incredible. So I think it just goes to show how powerful the effortless um, process is in helping people. Now, when we're trying to walk through this, I'm a big believer that the types of uh, answers you get are based on the type of questions you ask. If someone's on one side and they're saying, okay, uh, I'm not really sold on the effortless, li effortless lifestyle or effortless concept. I'm going to keep doing yeah. things in the grunt way versus the person says, I'm all in. I'm tired of being exhausted. I'm tired of being frustrated. Um, priority, the priorities with apostrophe S is leading me to feeling overwhelmed because I got too many of them to kind of jungle, juggle. Yeah. What types of questions are they asking themselves? How do they keep themselves kind of under wraps and ongoing? Well, I mean, I think that you can simplify a lot of life into two questions. Uh, the first is, um, the first is what's essential, mm -hmm. uh, right? Because, because most stuff is trivial. Uh, you've got a vital few things and then you've got the trivial many. And mm -hmm. uh, so the first question to come back to again and again, right? What's essential here? What's essential now? What's important now? What's the, the, the priority for today? What's the one thing I need to do today? Yeah. Um, that's the first question. And then the second question is just, I mean, we've kind of already mentioned it here, but it's just like, uh, how, how can I make that thing as easy as possible? How can I make it mm -hmm. effortless? Now, there's all sorts of ways that we can do that. Yeah. Uh, one, one way we can do it is when we're taking on a major project, uh, we can ask a, a series of sort of sub questions, right? What does done look like? Uh, yeah. Just even defining that so it doesn't just grow and grow and grow as we're doing it. And, and suddenly five years have gone by and we haven't actually got to the end of the result. So that's, to me, a, a powerful question. And let's just double click on that simple sounding question right there. The, uh, uh, it's, it's an interesting story from the king of Sweden uh, who decided he wanted to build this, uh, this juggernaut of a, of a ship. Uh, to, to show his, uh, his prowess compared to the other <laughs> fleets. And, and he, he, he secures the shipbuilder uh, and he says, look, you have unlimited funds. Uh, we, we've got a forest with a thousand trees to build this one ship, you know, go. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they build it. They, 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 cut the, they cut the wood. They get it. They, it's shaped. It's ready to go to, to put together as a ship. And the, the, the king says, well, actually... Instead of being 135 feet long, I want it to be 165 feet long. Okay, so now they have to just to throw all that wood away. They can't use any of it. They got to go cut the wood again, and it keeps on going like this. He keeps adding and adding and changing his mind. And, and oh, I want to have 35 cannons. No, actually, I want to have 70 cannons in two rows. Okay, actually, I want to add. I mean, talk about a non-essential addition. I'm going to put. I want 700 sculptures. Wow. that I want you to put onto, onto this ship to make it look so impressive, right? He, he does that. This, this, like one of these changes is said to have given the shipbuilder a heart attack and killed him. Oh, wow. So now the second in command is now, is now the shipbuilder. <laughs> so this is like a sec, now second yeah. generation and the changes keep coming. Well, the day arrives, not at the completion of the ship. Like literally they still haven't defined what done looks like or actually achieved it yeah but they still he has had time the king has had time to invite all of these vips from the neighboring countries to come and see this the ship's called the vasa uh, the vasa set sail it's not mm -hmm. done but he wants to show it off so as it comes out for its maiden voyage they have all of the cannons out mm -hmm. so that they can do a big gun salute to to the, the dignitaries that are on shore but a gust of wind comes along and pulls the Vasa over so that the cannons go into the water. And suddenly, <laughs> the whole ship is filled up with water. Within wow. one hour, the ship goes down, Jeez. Uh, along with all the 53 sailors on board. Mm. The maiden voyage, I mean, this is literally the most expensive ship in Swedish history. It goes less than one mile before it sinks. 
mm. and, and it's over. So it's like the, it, this is just like <laughs> the worst story ever, right? This is yeah. this is what the worst kind of project looks like. It, it, if you simply say what does done look like on the next project, you 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 already force yourself as a forcing function to to increase your probability of starting and completing the project. Other questions you can ask to streamline a project are, yeah. you know, what are the minimum number of steps to achieve it? Yeah. Uh, don't try to say, uh, but one story to go with that. Sure. You mentioned earlier on, I wanted to get back to it. These tech companies, Apple, Google, and so on. Apple and Amazon founders were both really good at a particular skill. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I came across case studies for each of them that are almost identical, even though they were dealing with different tech products. And I thought that was really fascinating. Wow. The, 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 the first is, is over at, um, first is at Apple. I interviewed, um, Mike Evangelist. That's his real name. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. and he was working for an, a DVD burning company at the time. Mm -hmm. This is when DVD burning machines were brand new industry specific, cost you $35,000 come complete with a 1000 page manual for learning how to use it. <laughs> oh right. You can gosh. imagine, right? Yeah. Yeah. Apple comes along. Steve says, I want to buy this because I want to take your software and I want to simplify it and create, put this standard on the map. So they're given two weeks to simplify their software offering. And they're really proud of how much they've simplified it. I mean, they're looking yeah. at this thousand pages, they've got it down, they've removed fun functionality and features and all sorts of things that they don't think are, 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 are valuable, streamline, streamline down. They're ready to give their presentation. Steve comes in the room and before they start, he goes, okay, hold on. Let me just go to the, he goes to the board and he draws a rectangle and he says, okay, this is gonna have one button. You drag your file to that button and then you click burn. That's mm -hmm. the app. That's what I want to build. Yeah. And they're all suddenly embarrassed of their presentation because it was so much more complex than that. But what they learned, and this is the takeaway and the key point here, is they said he said, he said, you have to learn to start from zero. Mm -hmm. We were starting with complexity and reducing the complexity, which is good but not great. The great thing is start from nothing. That's the ultimate simplicity and say, can I achieve this in one step? And if not one, can I do it in two steps and force yourself to be at the minimum possible number of steps rather than taking the maximum and going down a little yeah. bit. The story, at, at Jeff Bezos up at, at Amazon is again, I say that like the comparison is so striking. This is the beginning of Amazon early on when e-commerce is new. So people are uncertain about buying something online, you know, the buying mm -hmm. a book, they say they want to buy it. They go through the checkout process at the time. Every checkout process looked the same in every major e-commerce platform. Yeah. There was 25 steps involved. Mm -hmm. 25 times you're clicking, you put your name, click, last name, click, address, click, 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 you know, like everything. So there's this whole process. There's an engineer who's been given two months to simplify the process. He's doing the same thing as in the Apple example. He's saying, how can I streamline each step of the existing process? Mm -hmm. He goes and has a meeting with Jeff and with the, the, the first, um, the first employee of Amazon. They go over and meet at this brewery up in Seattle. And, and in that meeting, Jeff finally says, no, look, this is what I'm saying. I'm saying not how do we streamline what we have? I'm asking, can we do it in one click? Yeah. Well, that's what one click became yeah. known as at Amazon. Sure. I don't know how you'd value that decision, but I reckon it's one of the most <laughs> successful business decisions that's ever been made, right? I mean, they had a, a patent on that one click uh, buying for the next 20 years. Yeah. And you could say, well, that's unfair. And maybe it was, but the thing that that engineer said to me, which I thought was interesting, he said, nobody else was thinking like that. Yeah. I wasn't after two months of staring at this problem. No one else in any other company was. So yeah. that's the power. Steve's doing it. Jeff's doing it. They're saying, mm -hmm. start with zero. Can I do it in literally with Amazon's case, one click and almost literally the same with the DVD burning, uh, what turned out to be yeah. iDVD burn software that, that, that Apple put a standard on the Mac. Can you do it in one step? That's yeah. the key to simplifying any project you start on. Start with zero. I love it. You know, I'm, I'm just thinking about that. <clears throat> and now it's, it's gotten to the point where it's a, it's a double button click on your phone and ding. Purchase made, it's already on shipment, it's all coming. Man, I've loved the conversation. Um, I love your work. I know you have a, an amazing podcast. I want everybody to hear a little bit more about the podcast if you get a second. 
um, before we tell them where they can get the book and things like that. So tell us more about uh, the podcast. Listen, I appreciate that opportunity. It's uh, it's been out for a year. Uh, it's um, it's just it's top five uh, podcast on on Apple uh, in self improvement and in education, uh, and it's it's been a series of conversations. My the very favorite conversations so far have been with my wife Anna, uh, oh, keeping me awesome. honest, uh, yeah. talking about what essentialism really looks like in our lives and in, in our relationship. Uh, but we've also, you know, we've had big names on there as well. Uh, Matthew McConaughey and Jay Shetty and uh, yeah. the, the Property Brothers and all sorts of people <laughs> talking about, yeah, hey, listen, what is what is most essential in their lives and how can we all, you know, figure that out for ourselves, streamline so that we can uh, so that we can do what really matters most as effortless, as effortlessly as possible. I love it. I love it. And and your again, your content's amazing. It's clearly that you've learned a lot of lessons through a variety of different ways. Um, I know we don't really have time to jump, in, jump into some of those today. Where can everybody else find out more about you and Effortless? Because it's a book they've got to get. I mean, it's, it's got to get, I'm getting four or five copies for the audience uh, that I'll have, that I'll send to people that comment in the stream. So, but other, other than that, where can everybody get the book? Uh, I mean, the book's available absolutely everywhere that books are available. So, so, so Amazon one click, that seems like the right, the right thing to say <laughs> after this conversation. Uh, one, one You're click welcome, Amazon. Bezos. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He'll know. He'll know. He'll know we did this. Uh, we, we, you know, there's a, I have a one minute Wednesday newsletter that goes out, try to make it the most essential minute you're going to spend online each, each week. Uh, people can sign up for that at essentialism.com. You can take a 21 day essentialism challenge uh, right now, whether you get sort of micro masterclass videos sent to you each day for 21 days, just helping you to make small adjustments and the things you do often to be able to make what is essential a little easier today and tomorrow. I love it. I love it. Well, dude, thank you so much for spending so much time with us. I've, I've learned a lot. I've got a, a whole page of notes over here and stuff like now I have to go implement so I can <laughs> figure out some way to make things effortless. Uh, that's what it is. That's right. Dude, well, I loved it, man. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Thank, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. All right. Take care. If you love that interview, go ahead and check out this next one right here. You can actually achieve success faster. Yeah. Because I would be further in my career had I paid more attention to developing relationships earlier in my